So welcome everyone to our 12th meeting of our 2021 uh, virtual family, uh, Fabry family uh, meeting series. And so thank you again for being here. It's always nice to see, uh, I'm, all, I'm seeing all names at the moment, but uh, your smiling faces will pop up here and there. So just welcome again. And tonight we have the, uh, we are, um, have the pleasure of having Dr. Nadia Ali speak to us about um, stress, anxiety, and depression. And the talk is focused, uh, to my knowledge, mostly about Febrile disease, but we have so many other stressful things going on in the world today and in our lives that it's, I think it's a very appropriate topic. And uh, I'm sure what uh, Dr. Ali has to say will apply to not just uh, the things that we experience with Fabry disease. So I'd like to normally, uh, Don Laney, as most of you know, is with me as my uh, trustworthy co-host and Don is uh, not with us today. And she's uh, out celebrating her anniversary somewhere. So congratulations to Don. And, but I'll go ahead and do uh, Dr. Ali's introduction. I won't um, read her whole bio, but as you saw on the screen, as you were signing in, her bio is available on the speakers and bios tab on the registration website. So you can read the entire bio and I'll just give you some highlights. So uh, welcome, Dr. Ali, I'm gonna talk about you. So Dr. Ali is an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. She's the director of the psychological resources for the Emory Genetic Clinical Trial Center, where she conducts clinical research on a, a number of uh, focus areas. In addition to her own research, Dr. Ali provides neuropsychology as uh, psychological assessment for clinical drug trials within the Emory Genetic Clinical Trial Center. She is the co-author of the book, Transitions, Managing Your Own Healthcare, uh, What Every Teen uh, with an LSD, Lysosomal Storage Disease, uh, needs to know. Dr. Ali also serves as the co-assistant director at the Emory Genetic Counseling Graduate Program, where she's uh, training ge future genetic counselors. And uh, Dr. Ali earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of South Florida, went on to an internship in neuropsychology and a post-doctoral uh, fellowship in health psychology. And I'm, you know me, I'm surprised I got through all those words without stumbling too badly. But uh, welcome, Dr. Ali. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And you can share your slides at any oh, time. Oh, OK. You had initially told me that uh, I would be speaking about 20 minutes into the meeting. But if you're ready for me now, I'll, I'm happy to start. Oh, um, if yes. With, maybe that was when Dawn was talking. and not Oh, maybe so. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but. I can do, I can, well, sometimes we do announcements before. Okay. Um, we can, we, what's your preference, start now or wait through the announcements? I am at your service, whatever you would like. Well, then why don't you go for it and I'll do right. the announcements at the end. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see how to do this. We can see it. We just, uh, if you go into, um, yep, there you go. All right. So, now let me get this so that I can see you as well as my screen. All right. So, you see behind me the Genetic Counseling Program Office. I decided to do this from here rather than from my other office for or from home because this one has the best internet connect uh, stability. But if for some reason I do get cut off, I promise I will come back. I, I wanna start out by saying thank you again to you, Jerry, and to the National Fabry Disease Foundation for inviting me to join this education series. My presentation may be a little bit different from previous sessions in that I'm going to close with some exercises and techniques for decreasing stress, anxiety, and depression for all of us to practice and to relearn. 
So just to follow up on what Jerry said a minute ago, uh, we do have a lot going on right now in the world. And some of you may have heard me talk about coping with anxiety and depression in regard to COVID in this past year and a half. I'm going to start by sharing a quote that I read this morning from Dr. Kimberly Manning's Twitter feed. She is a physician here in Atlanta at Grady. Grady is one of our tertiary care hospitals. So it is the hospital that takes anyone and everyone, uh, especially the most dire of cases and those who don't have insurance. And this was a quote that she shared that her son's teacher said to her. And the teacher said, it took me some time to realize that pandemic best may be all we have right now. And that to hold you to something other than that just isn't fair. And that really struck me this morning. Because if you've heard me talking about coping during COVID, you'll have heard me saying that I'm definitely not performing, functioning, and coping at the level that I was prior to COVID. And that level was never perfect anyway, let's face it. But the pandemic is ongoing. It hasn't stopped. My daughter had to get tested just this past weekend for COVID because someone in her class was positive. So it's all, it's all something that we're still dealing with. And we need to keep that in mind when we talk about stress, anxiety, and depression. And we, we need to acknowledge to ourselves and others that, you know what, my best right now might simply be a pandemic best, but as long as I am trying my best, that's what I need to know. And that's what I need to do. And it's okay. So when we're all stressed out and know where to go, if there's anything that the last year and a half has been about, it's been about dealing with the unexpected. And we're still doing that. To some extent, that's resulting in coping skills deficits. Even if you had wonderful coping skills before, sustained stress, sustained anxiety, sustained depression over a long period of time can leave us feeling overwhelmed. And Jerry said that I was going to apply all this to Fabre, and I am. But I'm, you're also going to see me talking about it in a general sense, because stress, anxiety, and depression, while studies have, in fact, there's a new, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a brand new um, article that just came out called Depression, the Hidden Problem in Fabrate Disease. Uh, well, it has been documented in higher rates in those who are living with Fabry disease than in those not living with Fabry disease. It is still something nonetheless that can occur in anyone. Okay, so here we go. Yeah. I didn't turn the slide in time for that one. There are two different kinds of depression. There's depression due to internal factors, that is chemicals in our brain, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and that's what medication can help with to provide more of certain neurotransmitters than others. And there is not enough known yet to know whether depression is an organic factor of Fabry disease or whether it is a external factor, a reactive factor to living with a chronic progressive disease or whether it's a little bit of both. And that's the second type of depression is external uh, factors, depression and reaction to chronic disease or going through a divorce or a death in the family or an ongoing pandemic. Okay. Now there are a lot of different kinds of anxiety as well. And uh, you can show show of hands behind your 
behind your name or in your head if you'd like. Normally, if I'm talking in person with folks, I invite them to do so. So there's test anxiety, as this young girl is having. There are phobias, such as fear of heights or spiders or anything else. There are medications for which the side effects include anxiety. Some of these medications are listed here on the slide. Hopefully you can see them. Ironically, some antidepressants can also have side effects that include anxiety. So you definitely want to work with your physician to figure out and manage side effects if you, if you think that anxiety or depression might be a side effect of medication. And then there are also internal triggers for anxiety as well. Insomnia is not internal, but that's another one of the external ones. Anxiety can cause in, uh, insomnia and then insomnia can then turn around and contribute to depression and anxiety. So it can become a vicious cycle. Stress, depression, and anxiety they also have an effect on our ability to think clearly. And those of you who have met me in person know that I have been doing a study on the Fabry fog for a number of years now. Unfortunately, had to pause it during COVID because it involves a lot of face-to-face -face time with me, and I did not want to be responsible for making anyone else sick. So it was paused for the last year and a half, but it has recently resumed. If you're interested, you can contact me. But depression and anxiety and stress have known influences on our ability to pay attention and our ability, our ability to concentrate. Stress, anxiety, and depression also have known influences on memory, especially short-term memory. This, is, this picture is Dory from Finding Nemo. She, the movie, she has short-term memory loss and the movie portrayed it to great comedic effect to give a sense of what that's like. Stress, depression, and anxiety can also play a role on executive functioning processes. And by that, I mean your frontal lobe here in the brain and ability to plan and organize and think abstractly. There's been quite a lot of evidence um, regarding the Fabry fog, and I just spoke about that for uh, FSIG about a week ago. So we won't we won't go into that here. But if you are someone who suspects that you may have elements of the Fabry fog, and or have external factors going on in your life that you feel are contributing to stress, anxiety, and depression, which are then contributing to your ability to think clearly, you do definitely want to go talk to a physician um, and or to a neuropsychologist who can help you with tricks, techniques to improve your memory and your attention and your cognitive abilities. All right, moving forward. So what can we do? A few recommendations. The first is to accept the feeling. Anxiety, for example, is nothing to be ashamed of. Neither is depression. They're feelings just like any other feelings. And when we feel guilty about them, or we feel that there's something wrong with us for feeling that way, then it makes it worse. We feel worse about ourselves and that makes our anxiety worse and our depression worse and our stress worse. So trying to fight it doesn't work. So I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, I'm sorry, you want me to do what with my anxiety? It's true. When you're in the midst of your anxiety, if you're lying there sleepless at night in your bed and you can't get to sleep because of all the thoughts that are rushing through your head, uh, all the fears and the anxiety. Practice telling yourself, this isn't me. This is not a reflection of me. This is my anxiety. Okay? Separating out your anxiety from yourself. This is not a reflection of my self-worth. This is my anxiety. 
Maybe it'll feel better in the morning. For some people, it does. Maybe it'll feel better if I do certain things like exercise. Maybe it won't. All of us have different ways that we cope with anxiety. But being able to separate it from our own self-worth, that can be a key to it not contributing towards depression. Right? So practice watching yourself. Practice becoming aware, reflecting on your thoughts, becoming conscious of your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions and your sensations. And just observing them with compassion, without judgment for anything that you're thinking or feeling. General stress management and tips, including scheduled time for yourself, which can sometimes be easier said than done. Giving and receiving affection regularly, whether that's with a pet or your children or your parents or your spouse or whomever else is dear to you. Touch, physical touch is very important, particularly for depression. Practice relax relaxation exercises. And we're gonna talk, about, we're gonna actually go through some of those in a little bit. There's an audience participation part to this session. Make the most of your downtime. What relaxes and de-stresses me is different than what relaxes and de-stresses you. So when I have downtime, I may choose to do something different with it than my husband, for example, he gets up at 5.30 in the morning to exercise. No, <laughs> it's not going to work for me. I would prefer to tune out the world and read a good book or snuggle up with a cat, one of our cats. So when I have a lunch break, for example, if I can help it, I'm not going to eat at my desk. Here at Emory, we do have a mask mandate. We're not supposed to take our masks off inside. So I may choose to go outside so that I can eat my lunch and also perhaps take a good book with me, sit in the shade under a tree and try to relax while I eat my lunch before I go back in to continue working. Prioritize tasks, AKA don't sweat the small stuff. Right now, there are more things that we may need to be doing than we can realistically be doing. And so we have to decide what are things that must be done right now, today, like for example, preparing for this talk. And what are things that can wait until tomorrow or at least tonight, like doing the breakfast dishes that I left behind at home. Delegating tasks if possible. My oldest daughter is uh, old enough now to make her own lunch for school so that my husband and I aren't doing that because we have way too much we need to be doing. And we put her in charge of making her sister, her younger sister's lunch as well. And we got a nice surprise when we delegated. Not only is she making her younger sister's lunch, but we found out after the first week of school that she had been sticking little notes in her sister's lunch. The first one said, you got this. That was nice. Resist perfectionism. Okay, you can see I'm in my office in the genetic counseling master's training program. I just gave a lecture last week on Monday to our incoming new crop of future genetic counselors. And one of the first things I said to them, the lecture was on uh, surviving graduate school, is I want you to try your best, but you do not have to be perfect. And I tell my children that, and I try to tell myself that. What's important is that we try our best. We're never going to be perfect. I am not perfect. I am never going to be perfect. And that's a hard expectation to live up to. And often we are the ones who place it upon ourselves. So resist perfectionism, followed by asking for help. If I'm having help, if I'm having trouble with something, frequently it's technology. 
that's just not my area of expertise. If I try for 10 or 15 minutes, 20 at the max, after that, it's time for me to go ask somebody who knows more about this than I do and get help. Same thing for everyone else. All right. Connection combats isolation. Like the Fabre camp at Victory Junction, like this series where uh, you get to see each other's names, hopefully each other's faces later on, or support groups online, February groups on the internet and or in person. Peer-to-peer -peer contact with people who understand what you're going through cannot be emphasized enough. And I know that's what the National Fabre Disease Foundation is all about. Empathic communications. So a lot of times others don't understand whether that's what it's like to live with Fabre or whether that's choices that are made in a pandemic or whether that's why I did the thing that I just did that you don't like, whatever it is, or vice versa. Empathy is central. Okay. Empathy with each other and with ourselves. Listening to the reasons for someone else's behavior, the reasons behind someone else's behavior, while continuing to affirm their dignity, their integrity, and their sense of autonomy is key to ever hoping to have an impact on someone else's behavior and also key to maintaining a relationship with that person if that's someone that you would like to keep a relationship with. So you wanna make time to listen to each other's story. Try to understand each other's perspective, whether it's a family member that you're disagreeing with or a coworker or anyone else in your life. Expressions of empathy for each other's situation and their attempt to function. Exploring and addressing each other's questions, anxieties and concerns, and sources of support. I may not agree with someone, but I can have empathy for the fact that they're hurting or they're struggling. And making sure that each member of the family, Fabre is a family condition, that each member of the family has someone to do this with, that the kids have someone they can feel certain of going to for empathic communications, that your spouse does, that you do. Doesn't have to be someone within the family, but someone. And those of you who've heard me talk before have sleep, seen this slide before because I put it in almost every single presentation I ever give, which is that Sometimes the only way to get through life on a day-to-day -day basis is to laugh at the absurdity of it. Some things in life are just absurd. And <laughs> sometimes there's nothing we can do but try to keep a sense of humor, like this poor polar bear. Celebrate milestones. That's important too. A couple slides ago, I said, don't sweat the small stuff. But celebrating this, the small stuff is equally important, whether it's that the new baby just slept for the first night, and so the new parents just slept for the first night, or I got an A on that algebra test, or your kid got an A on that algebra test, or I did it, I did that thing, whatever that thing was, big or small. I did it. It happened. It's important to, to celebrate milestones. Other coping skills, okay? There are a lot of different ways to approach stress, anxiety, and depression. I uh, don't have nearly enough time to go in depth about all of them, but here's a couple of them. Okay, there's advocacy. Again, that's what the National Fabry Disease Foundation is all about. Advocacy on behalf of Fabry disease and those living with Fabry disease to make sure that attention and research and uh, recognition are given to Fabry disease. 
and helping others who have it. Finding your passion. Just as what relaxes me is different than what relaxes you, what I'm passionate about is different than what you're passionate about. So if you're passionate about, um, I don't know, fishing, that's something you want to make sure you get to spend some time doing. Whatever it is that makes you feel alive, that's something you want to be sure to put in your schedule on an at least a weekly basis. Lots of other coping skills, lots of other kinds of therapies. There's face-to-face -face therapy, counseling, that's the one we usually think of. But there's also art therapy, music therapy, pet, uh, well, nature therapy. Pet therapy is a really big one because it really does have proven results. So do all the others. And sports therapy. My favorite of which is axe throwing, uh, something that was in vogue a couple of years ago and I went to do at a friend's birthday party. And as long as you wear closed toed shoes, it's, it seems safe and is a great reliever of stress. All right, so now it's time for the audience participation part. We're gonna talk about diaphragmatic breathing. We're gonna talk about a couple of techniques, three to be exact, three tools and techniques that are free that you can do by yourself whenever and wherever you want. You don't have to go see a physician for um, that have a proven demonstrable effect on stress, anxiety, and depression. Hopefully you've heard of all three of these before, but uh, so we're gonna relearn them and practice them. If you haven't, now's a good time. So the first one, diaphragmatic breathing, also known as deep breathing. You can see this little figure of the man. He's, he inhale through the nose, goes down through your chest. If you put your hand on your belly, when you do it right, you'll be able to feel your belly move out as the breath comes in. So long, slow, deep breath in through the nose. Then you hold that for a count of maybe three and you let your breath out through the mouth this time, always in through the nose, out through the mouth. And you exhale, you'll feel your belly come, uh, come back in. So we're gonna practice that a little, okay? So I want you to close your eyes. Sit with your eyes closed and turn your attention to your breathing. Breathe through your nose naturally without attempting Think about anything else. Be aware of the sensation of your breath as it enters your nostrils. Place one hand on your belly and the other hand on your chest. Take a deep breath in, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, exhale through the mouth, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, breathe out for a count of four. <coughs> and the belly should go in as you inhale, I'm sorry, out as you inhale and in as you exhale. Concentrate on your breath, forget everything else. You may start to become aware of how much is in your brain, how busy your mind is. Resist the temptation to follow those thoughts and just focus instead on the sensation of your breath. If you discover that your mind is wandering, bring it back to your breath. In, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, and exhale two, three, four. Repeat this as many times as necessary until your mind just focuses on your breathing. The sooner you make this a daily habit, the quicker your brain and your mind will be trained to go into this state when you want to. 
And what are we doing with this? We're getting more oxygen to our brain. More oxygen helps us calm down, helps our brain focus, helps us center. Again, it doesn't cost anything and you don't need a prescription. You can do it first thing when you wake up in the morning. You can do it in the shower. You can do it while you're driving. You can do it at work. Your coworkers don't even need to know you're doing it. You can do it at night when you're trying to sleep. Okay. All right, that's diaphragmatic breathing. The next technique we're gonna talk about is progressive relaxation. In progressive relaxation, we're gonna take the deep breathing that we just learned about, and we're gonna use it to get more oxygen and calm down and focus. But we're also gonna train our muscles to be aware of what a tense state feels like and what a relaxed state feels like. Many times, our muscles slowly tense up in our body to the extent that we don't even realize they're tense because that's our baseline now. That's our normal state of being. And if someone puts their hands on your shoulder behind you, they may say, whoa, you're tense. And you haven't even realized it. So what we're gonna do now is remind our muscles of what being tense feels like compared to being relaxed so that again, our body can learn conditioning for how to relax, okay? So for this relaxation, you can either sit or lie down, but for now, let's just sit. Make sure that you're warm enough, not too cold, yet you're comfortable. Let your hands rest loosely in your lap or by your side. Now close your eyes again. Be aware of your breathing. Notice how your abdomen, your belly rises and falls with each breath. Take a long, slow, deep breath in through the nose, all the way down to the stomach. Hold the breath for just a moment and then exhale through the mouth. Allow your breath to carry away all stress and tension as the air comes out of your lungs. Let your breathing rhythm return to normal and relax. I'm gonna ask you to tense various body muscles throughout your whole body. Please do this without straining. No need to strain your muscles. You don't need to exert yourself. Just contract each muscle firmly but gently as you breathe in. If you feel uncomfortable at any time, you can simply relax and breathe normally. So let's start with our feet and toes. Breathe in through the nose, and as you do, gradually curl your toes downward and tense the muscles in the soles of your feet. Hold your breath for just a few seconds and then release the muscles in your feet as you breathe out. Feel the tension in your feet wash away as you exhale. Notice how different your feet feel when you tense the muscles and when you relax them. Take another deep breath in, tense the muscles in the soles of your feet and hold this position for a few seconds. Now release. Find yourself relaxing more and more with each breath. Your whole body is becoming heavier, softer, and more relaxed as each moment passes. Next, bring awareness to your lower legs, to your calf muscles. I'm not gonna go through all the muscles, but we would go, th if you wanna do this, you'll, you'll go through each set of muscles separately, working your way up from the bottom to the top, typically, to, to train your muscles and remind them 
what it feels like to be clenched and what it feels like to relax. Pairing that with a deep breathing, you can help your body relax. All right. The third technique and tool that I wanna talk about, and they're in this order for a reason, is guided imagery. Guided imagery is also free, can do it anywhere. You don't need a prescription. It is proven to relax, reduce stress and anxiety. All of these things also have an impact on our health in terms of blood pressure, cholesterol, and many other things. So we're gonna practice this as well. And I'm just taking you through a little bit of each one for the sake of time. So one of the most basic ways to use guided imagery to relax is to close our eyes and imagine being in a place that is peaceful and relaxing to you. It may be a place that you've actually been, maybe the place you are in now, or it may be a place that you create in your imagination. And again, what that place looks like for you may be very different from what it looks like for the person next to you. Could be a garden or beach or the woods or snuggled up in your own home, in the couch in front of the fireplace or a library or anywhere that is your special happy place, basically. And when you're there, okay, let's start. So close your eyes, allow yourself to get comfortable. Again, we're gonna begin with a few slow, deep breaths in through the nose, holding and out through the mouth, letting your body get relaxed as we've trained it with the progressive relaxation. Let your chair fully support your body as you continue to breathe and relax. Now use your imagination to picture yourself walking along a path. Walk slowly. It's a pleasant path, any kind that you wish. It's a beautiful day and you feel happy and relaxed. You can feel the warmth and the energy of the sunlight on your skin. Soon you come to a gate. You know this gate leads to a special place where you are welcomed, you are safe, and you are comfortable. Push the gate open and allow yourself to enter your very own special place. Focus on what it feels like. If you're at the beach, listen to the sounds of the waves gently lapping on the shore. If you're in the woods, focus on the sight of the light filtering through the leaves of the trees. Hear the birds singing. Smell the salt air or the fire place. Feel, use all your senses to become fully there. Whatever is pleasing and relaxing to you is found in this place. You're going to spend some time there. Take your time and enjoy your visit. You might do your progressive relaxation during this time. Spend whatever time is necessary for you to rejuvenate and to take care of yourself. Again, we're not gonna stay long right now for the sake of time. When you are ready to leave, get up in your, from your place, go back to the gate. Slowly, open the gate again, push the gate open and return to the path that led you here. As you make your way back up the path to the here and now, remember that you can use your imagination 
to return to your private place at any time you wish or need to. You're now ready to resume your day. Stretch gently and open your eyes, feeling refreshed and alert. Okay, so those are three techniques that I want you to remember exist. Most of us have heard of them, if never, if perhaps not practiced them. Deep breathing, progressive relaxation, and guided imagery. Here was my slide for the path. And then there's all that other stuff, making sure you get good rest, exercise to your abilities, healthy eating, talk with your physician. The things I've just mentioned and focused a large amount of tonight's talk on are things that we can use ourselves. But when do we seek more help? Okay. When is it time to go talk to someone outside of ourselves? Perhaps a professional. When other things aren't working and your anxiety or stress or depression is getting in the way of your daily functioning. If you're no longer able to function at the level that you need to be, and I don't say want to be, but need to be, because there's a difference, then I would encourage you to try counseling or even medications, if, that, if that's what's recommended by a physician that you trust. Take advantage of mental health resources. Psychologists and other counselors are available for individual counseling, for family counseling, and sometimes for group counseling. You can pick whatever you think you would be more, most comfortable in. And I always tell everyone that I give referral information to that counseling is very much a matter of a good fit. So if the first person that you try, first counselor you try, doesn't fit well with you, don't give up on counseling itself. Just try a different person. Because it is very much about finding someone that you trust and feel comfortable working with. And it's worth the patience to find that person. All right, I'm not quite sure how long I've been talking, but I wanna say thank you. That's what I have for tonight. And I am definitely open to questions. I will stop sharing my slide at this point in time. Thank you, Dr. Ali. If anyone has questions and they have not entered them, entered them into the chat box, please do so. Um, I can't see anyone, anyone that has put them in the group. Uh, Dr. Ali, do you have any that, that have come straight to you? Nothing that's come straight to me. I see your message that uh, you're taught deep breathing and pulmonary rehab programs also, and I'm so glad to see that. Yeah, right. um, my mother has some lung health issues as well, and she's been working on that too. Right, and it was... Um, my own experience was with with pulmonary rehab and deep breathing and um, and it really is a stress reliever in addition to really helping your lungs because I don't know um, if a lot of people experience the same degree of lung function or lung dysfunction as I do. I'm about fifty percent um, about fifty percent lung capacity from Febri disease, and I think as we get older and we're Getting, uh, we're getting through some of these other difficulties that we start, you know, we realize what's happening with our lungs that we haven't really focused much on. So it was really helpful from that point of view also. And, uh, and of course, uh, all the stressful lives that we live, it's definitely helpful on a daily basis. So I'm happy to, I do deep breathing all the time. I haven't tried the other techniques really, but uh, so do we have any other questions um, from the group? 
It looks like you've done a great job and answered all of our uh, questions tonight. Thank you. And so thank you very much. And so the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to uh, show you a slide with a few announcements on it. But as we always do, um, we also do a prize drawing for the uh, primary attendees who are the people with fibroid disease, family members and caregivers. So um, put the word stress in the chat box and then um, Brenda can calculate. We do a random number generator and, and calculate a winner, but she's not going to announce the winner until after I've done the uh, announcement. So um, I'll switch over and share my screen. And uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Ali. This is a slide that I show at each of our meetings. And then in, our intentions here are to uh, let everyone know about what's going on in industry with the different programs. And so you can see at the top, I um, mean, you can see the, the slide you should be seeing has uh, Sanofi Genza highlights at the top and then Sanofi Genza as the first bullet line. Is that what you see? Someone? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the, the intent here is we've asked each of the industry programs to tell us a couple of the most important resources that they would like you to know about. And so if in Santa Fe Genzyme, it's a couple of their websites that where they uh, provide information that would like that they would like everyone to know about. And the same with Amicus Therapeutics and uh, Casey has their uh, fairly new Rethink Fabry website. And then the next uh, set, Avrobio, Sangamo, Skip uh, or Dorsio for a moment, 4DMT and Freeline all have active clinical trials um, ongoing that they're looking for people to enroll in. So you can find information um, in, in, their, in this area and in another place I'm going to show you where you can get more information. And then of course, the last one I'm gonna mention is the Dorsia and they are not uh, still enrolling um, participants in their trial. The trial is closed, the recruitment is closed, but the trial is still ongoing as they're gathering data and um, getting ready to present their solution to the FDA for approval when it's time. So Jerry, this is- uh, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, the right part of the screen is being cut off, so we can't see the addresses completely on a majority of the- What is in front of it? The right side of the screen. We can't see like on Genzymes, the very- the that last, There you go, thank you, sir. Okay, I'm not sure what was going on there, but fine. So, so this slide is, in, the, the uh, presentations are recorded and we'll have the recording for this slide up in a couple of days. And so you, and you can go into the website where you're registered and go to the far right tab where it says archives and recordings. And you can see all of the recordings of the past 10 uh, presentations. And this one, number 11, will be up there in a couple of days. So you can go back to recording and pause on this slide if you want any details off it. And then the slide that I'm gonna show you next is another way to get to industry information if you're interested in anything. And so, this is on our website. So if you go into the National Fabry Disease Foundation website and on the top menu bar, you go over to the last tab where it says company and clinic info, select pharma info, select that tab and you'll see what's on the lower left and you'll see a square for each of the industry partners. At the bottom of that grid square, you'll see a read more uh, link. Select the read more and you'll see on a bunch of resources that each industry partner has put in there that they think are um, beneficial for people to know about. So it could be websites, it could be infographics, it could be uh, videos, um, various things, PDFs, um, and resources that they'd like to share with everyone. So you can go into the Read More and find all those resources and ways to contact them also. So that is a permanent fixture on our website. You can also do the same with support organizations, which would take you down to the lower right of my screen. And you'll see this view only shows two um, tabs for the National Fiber Disease Foundation. 
there are actually three now, and the middle of those three also contains all of the links to the recordings for this meeting series. So you'll find all the 11, uh, or as soon as we get this one up, 11 recordings that you can go into the website and find them and uh, listen to them and view them. And then of course it's on our YouTube channel. So plenty of places to go and see the recordings in any of the details on this presentation that you might like to go back to. Let me uh, go to my next slide. We have plenty of um, Fabry Disease educational uh, calendars left. So if you'd like one, just uh, shoot me an email. We're trying to get them out to everyone that has attended um, one of the meetings, but if we don't get it to you, if we miss something, just email me, we'll get you the educational calendar in the mail. And lastly, just continue do, if you've been to these, continue doing what you're doing. And as each meeting ends, we disable that link. We do the recording, put it over in the archives tab, and then we activate the next link. So in the next couple of days, you'll see that the, the next presentation on chaperone therapy by Dr. Ganesh from Mount Sinai, um, you'll see the, um, to register, you'll see the link to register for that presentation. And then in turn, the next one after we close that. So let me uh, finish these, stop sharing my screen. Okay, so the last uh, thing that we're going to do tonight is Brenda, do you have a winner of the prize drawing? Brenda, are you with us? <laughs> we lost Brenda. Sorry, I forgot to <laughs> unmute myself. That's okay. Um, yes, we do have a winner, Cheryl Barkham. Cheryl Barkham. So Cheryl Barkham is the winner of the a $100 Amazon gift card. Congratulations, Cheryl. And again, we'd like to thank Dr. Ali and thank Brenda for her uh, support. And um, thank you all for attending and we'll see you next time. Good night.